Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Eugene Dietrich, Jr. He's also a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. And Colonel Dietrich, thank you very much for your time with us today, sir. Thank you for having me, sir. Where were you born and raised? I'm not sure of the city of Pittsburgh, somewhere near there. And then my parents were professors at West Virginia University, and we moved there uh, as soon as I was born. That's been my home. So growing up, you were there at Morgantown. Your mom taught chemistry. Your dad taught agriculture. So from a, you came from a very academic home. How did that influence you throughout your career? The made me very brilliant. <laughs> no, uh, they came there in 1922. And I guess about three or four families came that way as single people and met and got married. In the middle 30s, the state published a law that two people in the same family could not be on the faculty. Mother's whole life was teaching. Uh, Dad had a friend down here in Washington, D.C., who was with the uh, Bureau of Standards, and he had a job when he came down here. In 1938, when I was starting to high school, Mother made the decision that I should come down and be with my father for a while, and also that the schools were better here here than back in West Virginia. That was quite true. I left with four A's and ended up the first year with four D's and a C, which always reminded me of General one time said I was called in for the course said, I see you got a C in one of our courses. He said, yes, I spent too much time on that course. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, went to high school here and then was appointed to West Point. I went back to West Virginia for one year and then went to West Point in 1943. We'll get to West Point in just a moment. Was there any previous history in your family of military service? My father was a chemical engineer during World War II. So you were 17 years old when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and the U.S. entered the war. Do you remember how you reacted? Was that when you decided you definitely wanted to be in the service? No, I really didn't know what I wanted to be yet, probably a teacher or something. When Pearl Harbor happened, I was ice skating on the Lincoln Memorial Pool, and I was living at 17... 17th and N Street, up near DuPont Circle. I started home and my, my couldn't understand what all the sirens and running around was. I was uh, <clears throat> living in Dad's fraternity house. He received another job when they opened the DuPont plant back in Morgantown. And the lads in the fraternity house where we normally ate said they would keep me until I graduated for the last year. I was like everyone else, where is Pearl Harbor? (laughs) But uh, that's how. And when I was in the cadet corps here, I was a regimental captain. My mother once said, my son will never go to war. He will go to Leavenworth first. When I returned for the first year in West Virginia University, <clears throat> Mother said, have you ever thought of West Point? That rather shocked me, and I said, no. About all I know about West Point is that they beat Navy every year at football. The head of the PMS&T there was uh, a colonel. She asked me if I'd go over and speak to him. He had two sons. One was in West Point, and the other was going and ended up a classmate of mine. But he talked to me, and it sounded good, and so I said, yes, I'd like to go. We had, fortunately, uh, no political connections, but uh, the head of the local newspaper there had uh, an affinity for the cla- uh, my parents, and he was Jennings Randolph man in West Virginia. And I think he's assisted a great deal in my getting the appointment. 
Now, you made a couple of famous friends there, from what I'm told, uh, sons of very famous military men, George yes. Patton Jr. and James Doolittle Jr. Yes. How did you become friends with them, and what was that like? Well, I always remember a story of George Patton, to maybe. I came to a class reunion one time, and he was just leaving the counter. He said, Lady, I want you to always remember I'm the godson of George C. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there were many general sons there that had come because of the war and were in my class. Jim Doolittle and I uh, were in adjoining companies at West Point. And our second year, when we could go home for Christmas, I couldn't make it home and back in the short time we had off. So John, or Jimmy, asked me to come down with him to his mother's place here in Washington. She had a small apartment out on Connecticut Avenue. We ended up with uh, the older son, Jim, his wife, and their child, who is now what we call Triple Junior, lives in California. And uh, John and myself, I'll never forget, Mrs. Doolittle was one of the most famous women I'll ever know. Her <clears throat> enjoying to me was breakfast is at 8 o'clock, you're sleeping on the kitchen floor, and if you don't want breakfast, just sleep in and we'll step over you. <laughs> it was a rather packed apartment. But after that, John and I became very close, and eventually I was accepted into the family. I'll never forget after about a year, I went to Mrs. Doolittle and said, Mrs. Doolittle, I have a problem. She said, what's that? I said, well, I'm too young to call you Josephine, but I'm getting damn tired of calling you Mrs. Doolittle. She said, we can solve that quickly. I said, about a year ago, Jim was made a duke in England, and I wrote him a letter and said, if you're a duke, I must be a duchess. And so she, in my mind, acquired the term Duchess, and that's all, the way I always re rem remembered her. That's a great story. It's a story I always tell. I went to, the, I think, their 50th wedding anniversary. The Air Force Association in uh, Los Angeles had put it on. I had a table, and they had to walk, walk by as they went up to the podium. Someone remarked, aren't they a lovely couple? And all I could think of, if it weren't for her, there wouldn't be a couple. <laughs> Talk about your time at West Point. Most of the time you were there were in the midst of World War II. So what's the atmosphere like there? I think it was like any other year. We knew the war was going on. Uh, West Point kept us very busy. And uh, outside of that, there really wasn't much association, in my judgment, with concerns of the war other than we felt like every other American citizen. We want to win it and get it over with. And we, uh, as we were the first three or the last three year class, and uh, the war had just ended before we graduated. I think we're all a little disappointed that we weren't in it. But It was in your plebe year, from what I understand, that you became fascinated with flying. No. How did you become interested in flying? Oh, pardon me, yes. Oh, definitely. Plebe year, before we, September when we started, we wore maneuvers up in upper New York. And on a rather dismal day, we were out on a march, and a T-6 airplane came by <clears throat> on a simulated strafing run. 
And as he went by, I saw him wave. And it was then that I made up my mind, if I ever go to war, that's the way to go. And I worked toward that from there on. And they gave you the choice there about being in... At that time, you could join the Air, Air Corps. So, yes. so that you were then commissioned to the Air Corps in 1946. Yes. And where did you go then? I uh, went to Enid, Oklahoma. When we got our wings, we we were one of the classes to get our wings. When we graduated, we would finished pilot training. Went to e- Enid and uh, took transition in B-25s. And for the, from there, about 17 of us went to McDill Field and the B-29 bomb wing there. We're speaking with retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Eugene Dietrich, Jr. He's a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. You're listening to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest today is retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Eugene Dietrich, Jr. He's also a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. You had just been commissioned in the U.S. Army Air Corps from West Point. Uh, You had then been transferred to Oklahoma to do flying there. But shortly thereafter, in addition to being a test pilot for the the B-52s, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's still a plane that's still circulation today. How surprised are you that that's still up and running? My son tells me, my God, it's older than I am. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I checked out in the fourth one, never built the first B model. The first three were tandem seating, like the B-47, and the first B model were side by side. It's hard to believe. Now, that was quite an era of rapid evolution because we didn't even have jets during World War II. And then just a few years later, the B-52s are flying and all these other jets are in the air. I was stationed at Eglin Air Force Base and the first B-47 came in. And I'll never forget, I looked at it and said, if God will let me fly that airplane, I'll never complain of anything again. And I did. What was it like the first time you got behind that kind of power? Fantastic. People have asked me, what airplane is your favorite? And my answer is, I don't have one that's a favorite. They're all the same. You push the stick forward, the buildings get bigger. If you pull it back, they get smaller. The two flights that I'll never forget, as I mentioned, I started off in bombers, B-29s, B-17s. I worked around and was asked to check out in a P-51. I always said afterward I was glad I came from West Virginia with one leg longer than the other because I'd never felt torque like that before in my flying career. And that amazed me, the acceleration, the torque, and everything. The other flight I remember was my first flight in an F-104. And I was the commandant of uh, test pilot school in Edwards. I was going through 5,000 feet on takeoff and my brain was still on the runway. I'd never felt acceleration like that in my life. Was it exhilarating? Very much so, yes. Took it up and did my Mach 1. Let's talk about some of your other work uh, as a test pilot, and that was gauging the effect of nuclear weapons on pilots. Explain the, the program and your role in it. I think I was at Aikland. The first test I started were in Arizona with B-29s. And uh, the nuclear tests they were doing there. I did two of the tests at uh, Anahuitalk. One as a co-pilot in the B-47, and the other as a co-pilot in the B-52. Our purpose was to take the B-52 and fly out from the blast, and we would measure the effect upon the airplane when it, at various angles and such, normally going with it. Pilot dropped it, and then for the ones that it did an actual drop. One back just recently, people were talking about the atomic test. I checked my flight records, I'd been through 38 nuclear tests. Was there concern about radiation or anything like that on you? 
we were airborne, far away from it, and far away from the radiation. The blast was the one we were concerned primarily with, and we did that with the B-52B that uh, had been instrumented for stress during the flight test program of the B-52, and it could measure well the effects of blast and and later radiation, but that wasn't an effect. What kind of impact did the blast have on your ability to navigate and, and maneuver? None. None at all? You felt it. It was a real bump, and the brightness was considerable. We had blankets over the window and goggles on, and when the blast went off, the cockpit just lit up like it, there was nothing there. I sat sat on the ground during one of the tests at NOE talk, and uh, from Bikini where the bomb was, about the distance from I think Washington to New York. And when that hit NOE talk where we were, it was really quite an experience. I've long had a philosophy. If we get into a war and they shoot a thousand our way and we shoot fifteen hundred their way, what everyone should do is go out and watch it because it'll be the most exhilarating sight you've ever seen, and then pray to God that you die three minutes later. Our guest this week is retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Eugene Dietrich Jr., also a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. And sir, let's talk about Vietnam now. You actually volunteered to go to Vietnam. Why? Well, I was a graduate of West Point. The purpose of it is to fight for your country. I had spent five years being an executive officer to a four-star general who was commander of uh, MATS at the time. I decided if I were ever going to fill my pledge to be a warrior, I had to volunteer to go to Vietnam before it ended, and I, that's what I did. You initially had a desire to fly an F-104, but you were given different advice. I wanted to fly F-100s, and I'd ask General Estes to try to get me into it. By chance, one day I was in the Pentagon and ran into General Pete Everest, who's an old test pilot at Edwards and I had known quite well. He asked me what I was doing. I told him I'd volunteer, and he gave me some advice. He said, one, you've never been intact, and if Estes gets you into F-100s, I can assure you that you'll probably spend your whole tour in Saigon behind a desk because you've never been intact. And my advice is you volunteer for an A-1, which no respectable fighter pilot would be caught in, but if you can get through a year successfully with that, you can get into TAC and do what you want to do. So that's what I did. I went home. I didn't know what an A-1 was. I'll never forget the assignment went through. We moved from uh, Scott Air Force Base, bought a house in L.A. My wife and my son were there during my tour. I called a friend down at Douglas, and I said, can you get me a Dash 1 on an A-1 so I know what devil I'm going to be flying? said, we'll do better than that. We'll fly up to the Navy base where the stationed, and you can see it. So he flew me up there. We landed, and the first thing I saw was the A-1 with the 3360 engine on it. And I thought, my God, I volunteered for the wrong airplane because the same engine we had on the B-29. Fortunately, things had changed, and we never lost an engine while I was over there. But... Uh, that's how we got started in the A-1s. You ended up flying 402 combat missions, I'm told. Talk about your, I don't know if there is such a thing as a typical mission, but were you primarily engaging targets or other enemy craft? Our, ours was primarily a uh, close air support mission. What I found out in the early part that I was there, that we didn't have surface uh, air personal weapons and you could almost hang over an, 
in an engagement at 1,500 feet and be there. The second thing is we had endurance. We could spend five hours in the air. Whereas if a 104 or F-100 or F-4 came in, they had to drop their bombs or get home before they ran out of fuel. So it was a very, very good, almost as good as the A-10 right now. July of 1966 is perhaps the moment you're most remembered for, and that's the rescue of Navy Lieutenant Dieter Dengler, who had been taken prisoner uh, for about six months, and he had escaped from his captors. What happened then? We were on a mission one day, me and my wingman, and we started to taxi out. One airplane had problems, we went back, got it fixed, started out, and the other airplane had a problem. Fortunately, I was the squadron commander and was going to get a mission in that day, so we got a mission, and it was to go into northern Laos, and it was a free fire zone. Anything you saw that looked like an enemy uh, could be bombed. When we got up there, the two of us were, I had him high so he could stay in touch with Da Nang and we'd know where we were. And I was down about 100 feet. And as we approached, there was a mountain range in front of us and a river coming in. And fortunately, it, from my perspective, it went left. Everything worked out because if I'd gone right, I probably wouldn't ever have seen Dieter over the right. The A-1E was a two-seat airplane, so it, but it blanked out when you went right. I got to the thing, made my bank, and there was a big rock going across about three-quarters of the river, and there was a fisherman down there waving a white flag at me. I couldn't figure out what the hell it was. I went on for probably about 10 minutes. It just didn't seem right, so he went back and did it again, and he was still there waving. So I called my wingman and told him what I'd seen, and he'd come on down and go over it with me at a little higher altitude and see if he could tell anything. When we went over him, Wingman said, it looks like he's trying to write an SOS on the rock. Well, that inspired me. Because <laughs> you can fall into a trap. It could be an enemy wanting to come in to rescue him and shoot him down. But we went to the airborne command post. No one had been shot down in that area recently. Told them what, what we saw. We alerted the helicopter, the Jolly Green Giant, got permission to bring it in, and I took them to the uh, site. They picked up Dieter. I held my breath because I was scared to death that he'd get up there and blow himself up. (laughs) But they pulled him in, and that's when they discovered who he was, a a lieutenant in the Navy who had been a prisoner of war. i never forget, uh, I asked them where they're going, they said to, I forget where it is, Denai, not today, one of the other bases. So I said, myself, my wingman, and the two that escorted them and are going to Da Nang, refuel and get another mission. When I landed at Da Nang, as I was parking, I noticed down the line there was an ambulance near a helicopter. The base commander at uh, Da Nang was an old friend from McDill days, and when he came up normally, we had a cup of coffee if I left Da Nang, and I said, is that the guy they just rescued? And he said, what do you know about it? And I said, I think we're the ones that found him. Don't move. Next thing I knew, a big black car and two civilians got out, put me in it, took me for a debriefing of what had happened, told me to keep my mouth shut, and they kept it a secret for about two months. Because when they escaped, they went out in pairs, 
and Dieter and his associate, which was an Air Force helicopter pilot who had been a prisoner with him, came across a tribesman who was as scared of them as they were of him. They had a weed whacker, and somehow he took a slice and cut Dwayne's head off. And that's when Dieter went in and for about a week wandered around, and I found him on the rock. He was almost dead. And what he had done was picked up parachute flares that we used for night bombing and dropped a flare, and he had a whole bunch of those. Dieter told me later he was trying to write an SOS and just couldn't remember how to write it. But we, it was kept a secret. When did you finally get to meet him? When I came home in February of the next year, I found out he was at uh, North Base, I think, Navy base at uh, San Diego, and I was in touch with him and told him I was coming home. I said, my wife lives in L.A., and if you ever get up there, please call her. One of the stories that came from my wife was that he, TWA, I think, flew them, I flew his mother and his brother from Germany to San Diego to meet him. When they landed, Dieter invited Zane down to join them. Zane told me this later. She was standing next to Dieter and his mother when they met. And he said, is there anything you need? And she said, I'm hungry. He said, didn't you eat on the airplane? She said, I didn't have any money. I couldn't believe it. Dieter told me later he took her down to North Island to put her up in the VIP quarters. He came back the next morning to get her, and she was out washing the windows. I said, what the hell are you doing? She said, well, they've been so nice to me. I had to do something to have them repay it. She was quite a lady. I never met her, but I met Dieter when I came home, and we had a big party at my house. We, many people came by, and it was quite a reunion. And as I said, uh, people said, it was wonderful that you found him, and I said, I didn't find him, God did. The fact that both airplanes had problems that morning on takeoff, the fact that we were in a free fire zone, just the fact that on the river, the river went the right way, and I could see him. Otherwise, I think I would have just flown over and never known he was there. And I tried to trace him back a couple of years ago, and I, I say, I think I said earlier, Pete Everest was the thing that changed me from an F-100 to an A-1, and God did that. I, I was just a participant. A lot of different things. Yes got weaved together to allow that to happen. Well, that wasn't uh, the only significant thing that happened in 1966. In November, Task Force Prong was pinned down by the North Vietnamese, and you had a West Point classmate named Eliezer Parmley, who was in command. So explain how that unfolded. Well, Eli and I were at the A-1s, and he was head of Special Forces in two corps. And I think we did a lot of work together, made it more effective between both units. Lee was coming back from an operation, I can't remember the name right now, but he got ambushed. And they had a FAC flying over him. He called the FAC and said, do you know Colonel Dietrich? The FAC said, yes. He said, call him. Tell him his classmate is down here in deep S. So they called me, and I got a pair of us airborne. We went up, did some close air support, and got Lee home. And uh, they always said that was a little overdoing the classmate requests for each other, but I was glad that we were able to save them. Explain that tactically a little bit. How did you go in and 
create space for them to, to get out. Oh, well, that was doing the TAC above had pretty well worked with Lee where they were and where the when we got there, we were able to bomb the force against them. After your time in Vietnam, you worked at the Aerospace Research Pilot School. In fact, you led it. I was in Vietnam, and uh, my mind's going, I can't remember. The general commander of AFSC came over, and uh, we took him around. At dinner that night, I was sitting next to him, and he said, where are you going when you go home? Because I was about to go home. I told him I'd call General Estes, tried to get in an attack, and would wait. I hadn't heard anything from him. He said, uh, how would you like to be the commandant of the test pilot school? I quickly bit my tongue and said, yes, sir. Cleaned myself off, and I got that job. I was in the first class. I was stationed at Eglin and impressed me for years. First class of the test pilot school. And to come back as the commandant was a real, it's one of the two uh, command assignments I had that I shall never forget. We're speaking with retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Eugene Dietrich, Jr., a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. We've talked about his time at West Point, his time as a test pilot, uh, his tour in Vietnam, and uh, as, his, uh, as he led the test pilot facility at Edwards Air Force Base following that tour in Vietnam. In our last few minutes here, we want to talk about a couple of other things. First of all, after that assignment, you spent a bit of time at the National War College, and that led to a position with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Explain what that work was like. Well, I was in the National War College, and I didn't know where I was going. I got an assignment as an executive officer, the JCS. But it was quite interesting. A classmate of mine ended up a four-star admiral as the executive officer to a three-star general in J3. We put an order out to the... Europe, and about six months later, a friend of his, a two-star general, came back. And the general invited me into this. His friend said, you know, I'll never understand why we couldn't understand the message you had sent. Mel's ace was the three-star. He hit his desk, and he said, my God, doesn't anyone have a telephone? That was the advantage of the National War College. Two of us went through it as classmates, friends. But if he had sent a message out and I couldn't understand it, I could have picked up a thing and said, Wes, what in the hell are you telling us? And there was a whole unit over there, and anyone was scared to call I'll never forget that as an advantage of the National War College. You also led the Air Force Systems Command at Andrews Air Force Base. I was the director of test. When I finished JCS, I wasn't on the promotion list to BG, and I could see the end coming. One of my students at uh, test pilot school was now at AFSC, so I asked him if he could get me back into AFSC at Andrews so I could finish out my career. I had about two more years to go. And uh, he brought me back to work for the general there. He was replaced by General Bob Titus, Earthquake Titus, we call him. We're still very good friends. But I was the director of tests. You retired in 1974, 31 years after entering West 28 Point. 28 years. 28 after. years of active duty following your commissioning. As you look back at your career, sir, what are you most proud of? You were involved in so many groundbreaking missions and projects and service and war. What comes to mind first? First thing that comes to mind is I was a participant in saving an American's life. And uh, that was the best mission I'd ever been on. Secondly, with the people I worked with, they asked me, what's your favorite airplane? I said, there is no favorite 
It's the people you worked with. The airplanes are all the same. Two flights that I all will always remember, rather than the airplane, is checking out in the P-51. And when I was commandant of the test pilot school, I checked out the F-104. And I always said I was going through 5,000 feet, and my brain was still back on the runway. I'd never felt acceleration like that in my life. Last question. There were two films and a book written about the rescue of uh, Lieutenant Dengler. What was it like to be part of that kind of publicity and recognition? As I say, I think the recognition has always been overdone. I just feel I was a participant that God put in toward himself. I have a very good friend that's a member of my old Bold Pilots Association. We meet once a week. There are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but damn few of us are old bold pilots. He is married to a lady who is very outstanding in my judgment, who he met and hired as his wing walker. Nora and I were chatting the other day, and she said one of the things she's always been hesitant of, oh, you're a wing walker. And her answer is, I am a wing walker. But doing it, there are three of us, the airplane, the pilot, and myself, and they deserve all the credit that I do. So I feel that way, that I was just a participant. Colonel Diedrich, we thank you so much for your incredible service to our country over so many years, and we thank you very much for sharing your time with us today. Thank you for being here, sir. Thank you very much for having me. Retired U.S. Air Force Colonel Eugene Dietrich, Jr., a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. I'm Greg Corumbus. This is Veterans Chronicles.